Welcome to another episode of Armchair Architects. And we did it again. We started such a cool topic about platforms that we had so much more to say, we decided let's do a second episode so we can keep the conversation rolling. So I recommend you watch this and then go check out the links below and subscribe. But let's get back to the conversation right now with our architects. Hey, Eric and Uli, welcome back. Um, so you know one thing I really hate I cannot stand it when we're like in the middle of a really good conversation and we have to cut it short and we don't get a chance to really finish. So um, we've made the executive decision to come back for a part two to talk more about platforms because there was just so much more to talk about. So we're going to get into some of the things that you heard us sort of tee up in the in the first in the first one and come back to this. And to bring us back into into this subject, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about again um, success and failure when it comes to platforms. Right. So it seems to me that there are two ways things can go wrong. It can go it can be a failure or it can be a really good success. Um, and uh, and then stuff happens because now congratulations. Uh, it's it's a, tr a tremendous success that you didn't expect. So can we just talk a little bit about what it means to be successful when it comes to building a platform? And then what do you do when that happens? Because maybe it happens to you like a surprise that it's yeah. that successful. Yeah. So let me, let me start for once. Yeah, go ahead, Uli, please. Um, so I think the first thing that people that build a platform, let's assume you're a corporation uh, that is building a platform because of your specific need. Remember the customer conversation I had uh, in the executive briefing center I referenced last time. And you decide to go there. Now you have to realize that you now are serving customers. While you're not used to it, you might just be normally the customer itself, meaning you write code and you do stuff. But now you have to effectively think about other people depend on me, uh, that my capability is available. Um, and that's something you have to get used to. That means you have to think about, um, do I do service level agreements? Most likely if it's an internal platform, it's not going to be an agreement, but at least you need to have service level objectives and so forth so that everybody who takes a dependency on you um, knows exactly what the rules of the engagement are. Uh, you need to define things like throttling, you need to define uh, service hours, can you call me in the middle of the night? Uh, how does that work if something doesn't work and so forth? So effectively, you're becoming a service provider uh, to other folks, and you've got to think about that seriously. And <clears throat> that's, I think, step one. Um, what that means for you then is to think through what is my high availability architecture, disaster recovery, or business continuity? Then also, hmm, how do I detect failure? So a lot of times we don't really spend enough time instrumenting code. Again, I think, Eric, we talked about this in season one, about instrumentation, um, how do you be become a service, those kind of things. And a platform is ultimately a service writ large because you're now responsible for a bunch of applications running on top of you. And so monitoring instrumentation and the resulting monitoring is super critical. You need to think about um, you should be able to detect the error or the pro if there are any problems before your customers do in the ideal case. And that takes discipline. Uh, then you need to think about lifecycle management. So if you are going to update your platform because bugs exist, security patches, dependencies like operating systems need to be patched, how do you deal with that? So what's, the, what's your strategy to update? Is it going to be you're taking the whole thing down and everybody is down? Or is it a rolling upgrade? If it's a rolling upgrade, how much capacity do you have to do that? So there's a bunch of these kind of things that in often if you just built an app are not that prominent. They are there. You should think about all of them. But once you are a platform where many people depend on you, all of those become amplified. And you need to think about your change management is much more under scrutiny uh, instrumentation and those kind of things. Yeah, Eric, you had stuff you wanted to say, but I also have a question to follow up on this. Sure. Uh, the only thing I would interject or add on to what Uli said is, yes, you are now becoming a service provider. You have dependents, but there are two measures of success. And ideally, you want both. The first is the platform can be should be an engineering success. Uh, but the worst case is when it's an engineering success and nobody is using it. The converse is also true. If it's a engineering mess, but everybody's using it, now you have a different challenge because it can't scale, it's down all the time, and you're just letting everybody down. 
So I think the, the key things are to, to worry about are, you know, how can you measure success? How can you make sure you're building what people want? Uh, how can you support, and the, all the things that Uli said, support, how can you anticipate demand? How do you even work around chargebacks, right? If you eventually are going to build this platform and make this investment, ultimately, once it becomes popular and a runaway success, uh, you may even want to implement internal um, financial chargebacks from so right. people that want to actually utilize the platform. And then finally, uh, in order to avoid the scenario that I that I began with in the last episode, where somebody is like, Eric, I don't feel like I'm getting a lot of value out of the platform. You actually want to have data associated with the utilization of the platform. Are people using it? If they're not, why aren't they using it? And you have to approach it from a position of humility. The the overarching goal or idea might be, hey, everyone's got to use this. It's just an organizational mandate. Uh, and sometimes that works and sometimes mostly it doesn't. Well, I've also seen situations where some team is using an internal platform and they built it to scratch their itch. And another team was like, hey, that's cool. Like, can I get in on that? And and they're like, sure, okay, sure, yeah, you can. And then like from then on, and it's not necessarily from down upon a high, people say, thou, thou must use this platform. It's sort of like this thing that was meant to build in, for the small, all of a sudden now is doing everything. And in, in my experience, uh, those can be really hard to rev or get rid of or, or, you know, or, or, or maintain. Um, okay. One of the things that we promised that we were going to talk about in the last one was we we're going to talk a little about architecture of platforms. We've talked about some of that now. We've already said things like it has to be observable. You know, you have to think about it have to deal with failure. You, you know, we've talked about a number of these qualities. I'm just curious, as opposed to an app, you know, specific to a platform, what are some of the architectural concerns um, that, that come up? I mean, I can guess like capacity is one, but like what else? What else is in here that you got to think of? Well, I think that there's a bunch, right? There's functional and non-functional. Capacity, availability, all the uh, illities, right, are, are certainly there. Right. But I think the anatomy of the platform is something that has to be constantly looked at and constantly um, fo focused on and change over time as the organization's needs changes. But the way I think about it is that there's kind of three concentric circles. The first circle is the platform has to be able to understand and have a full command of the entities the core rules and validations associated with what it acts upon. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second concentric circle is, well, how do I actually expose these things? Like if, if the core entities are transactional systems or analytical systems or APIs of in other, uh, uh, you know, other microservice implementations, how do I actually implement a layer of abstraction that is coarse grained enough that is a joy to consume, not a pain to consume? And then if other people are consuming this API, how can I make it easier for them to stitch it together with even other microservices? And then on top of that, there's the, a, a secondary consumption plane. So if you're not integrating directly with the API of the platform, how, how do we actually integrate with low code, no code, business logic, um, you know, uh, uh, applications, experiences, and how can I make sure that without a code, you know, a coding background, I can actually consume this platform? Cool. Well, Lee, I, do you have ones? I have a question. I have, I have one in my mind. My... Yeah, I think you mentioned capacity. That's a good one. Um, you need to always think about this, not, not just for your own needs. Now you need to think about all the, everybody else's needs and how you service those. How do you get the signal from people? If it's an internal platform, I'm sure it's fairly straightforward, but you still need to work through it. Then I think there's a thing called a noisy neighbor. Um, so that means you now have a platform and all of a sudden you have my friend David using it and my friend Eric using it. And Eric has written very bad code. David has written clean code. Eric is hugging all of your resources. So you need to think about, do I need a resource governor? Um, so that effectively is a technology that watches for abuse and potentially either throttles or removes the noisy neighbor um, and stuff like that. Eric's point about extensibility is an important one. If you allow code to be built on top of your platform or integrated with the functions of your platform, like a SQL Server UDF, uh, you need to think through, can this code potentially impact the availability of my platform um, and so forth? And all of a sudden you have the uh, requirements. Again, remember you're serving many people now um, that you can't, effectively go and uh, do this. So if you go back to 
uh, SharePoint, for example, uh, bef in the, before the cloud versions showed up, the extensibility model was built right into SharePoint itself. And so upgrading the solution was very, very complicated because all of a sudden you now had to the SharePoint lifecycle, your code lifecycle, it all had to work together um, and so forth. ERP systems uh, used to work or in a lot of cases are still working like this. And so when you're looking at what SharePoint is doing, what the Dynamics team has done, they now all externalize uh, custom code uh, extensions and allowing through APIs and events to call back into the core engine. And that has a number of benefits because you can still extend the platform, but now you have on, you're on separate life cycles. So the platform can evolve independently of custom code that's associated with the platform. And I think those are some of the patterns that you need to dig, dig deeper into. A, do you want to allow this at all? Uh, originally, uh, when we were calling Office 365 um, uh, by another name, there was no extensibility because the system the team hadn't figured out the extensibility model yet. So we simply cut it all off, saying here, SharePoint, use it or not, you can't extend. Um, and that might be okay for a V1 platform to not support that kind of thing um, and grow into this kind of extensibility with more consideration. So I think of, I think of some of what you said as some combination of isolation and compartmentalization as being two of the qualities you want to really pay attention to. It and really then becomes what, a, you, what, re, what really ends up happening is you become, uh, you quickly sl slide down the slope into tenancy discussions, right? right. Is my, does my platform actually have to be multi-tenant? And all of a sudden you're like, multi-tenant, I sound like one of those hyperscalers now. Yeah. yeah. And what, what will I do? Yeah. What is a multi-tenant anyway, but we can talk about that. So I think, before you go into a platform business, I think that's the, the key piece. Uh, you should be very, very thoughtful. And let me throw another part piece into this one. Um, one of the new platforms that we are seeing, uh, people don't think of as a platform because it's not code or stuff like that, is actually data. So normally we're used to design data by use case. So we have a use case, the use case requires some data. We create a data model of some sort. If it's structured or relational or non-relational, it doesn't really matter. There is a schema of some kind of thing. And then you write code against this schema and everybody lives happily every after. What really is happening now is people are starting to say, hey, let's turn this around and saying, we built the first data set using one or two use cases, great. But now we have the data set. What other use cases can I actually build on top of this data set? And so you kind of turn the relationship around instead of making a one-to-one -one relationship between use case and data. You now say how, many, how much data can serve as a platform for how many use cases? And that way you avoid silos because that's another big piece uh, that uh, platforms actually solve. Um, is that there's too many silos everywhere that need to be maintained and you get more value out of the investments you made already. And again, I think the data and use case relationships makes that very plastic. It's very interesting to have this two-way relationship between the platform dictates the applications and the applications dictate the platform and back and forth that goes. Um, I think we've done a good job of at least leaving like a really cool hanging question for people to think about here. And I am very happy with leaving people with something to go think about. Um, feel free, please, folks, to put comments in, you know, when you when you watch this video, let us know what you think. Um, and uh, do check out the descriptions that we have here. So I think with that, we can close out. I've, I'm feeling much better that we can close out the, the platform discussion and move on to a bunch of other stuff we've got to talk about. I hope others will join us. Thank you, Uli. Thank you, Eric.